Several years back, I was asked to give a talk on the factors for awakening. And it turned out the people who had organized the event had asked for that topic under the impression that the factors for awakening were a description of the awakened mind. That this was the goal toward which we were aiming. Part of the misunderstanding was based simply on the way you translated the term bojanga. It could be factors of awakening. Because in Pali it simply says, awakening factors. But if you actually look in the text, it very much is factors for awakening. These are qualities of mind you want to develop in order to become awakened. It's not that you want to clone the awakened state, but you're just working on everyday factors of the mind, which eventually will lead to awakening. This is one of the important aspects of the Buddha's teaching is that the path to awakening is built out of very ordinary things, day-to-day -day things, and simply learning how to look at them in a new way and analyze them in a new way. This is especially important when you look at the second factor for awakening, because as those people who arranged that event had said, their impression of the factor, which is analysis of qualities was that in the awakened mind everything is just mental qualities, arising, passing away, arising, passing away, sort of with a great lightness. You see these things coming and going, coming and going, and they don't weigh on the mind at all anymore, which is an aspect of the path. But in looking at the, the factor that we were missing out on a very useful factor, or useful aspect of what that factor is all about, because when the Buddha talks about developing that factor, he says it's a matter of paying appropriate attention to what's skillful and what's unskillful. So instead of trying to clone yourself into a very rarefied state, the Buddha is asking you to look very carefully at what you're doing. To apply appropriate attention to what you're doing to see what is skillful and what's not. We often talk about appropriate attention as being a way of looking at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, but that builds on another aspect of appropriate attention, which is simply seeing things as skillful and unskillful, noticing what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. We talked last night about how this involves questioning. It's not simply a matter of conviction. Although the simple fact that you're going to follow this path of looking at what's skillful and unskillful requires that you are convinced that the Buddha knew what he was talking about, that there are wise people who've been trained in this path, and they know what they're talking about. Because when the Buddha talked ask you to look at what's skillful and unskillful in general terms, as when he's talking to the Kalamas, saying it's not simply a matter of looking at your own experience, but also taking into account the, the teachings of the wise, people whose behavior you've looked at and you've learned to trust. Because as the Buddha shows in his instructions to Rahula, it's not just looking at your own actions and then coming to conclusions about them. If you find that you've made a mistake or done something that's harmful, you go talk to somebody else who's also on the path. In other words, you seek the counsel of the wise. So it's partly looking for yourself and partly taking into account the counsel that you get from people who have more experience on the path. But in the ultimate analysis, it does come down to your willingness to look at your actions, to see where you're suffering, then ask yourself, okay, where is this suffering, or exactly what am I stressed out about? And you may have some general knowledge on the basic principles of that the stress comes from craving and clinging.
But the Buddha wants you to go beyond general principles. He wants you to see things arising and passing away. When does the stress come? When does it get intensified? When does it weaken? What else happens in the mind at the same time that it's intensifying? What else is happening at the same time it's weakening? That's applying appropriate attention. Now, to do this, of course, you have to develop the other qualities and the factors for awakening, starting with mindfulness, which keep, means keeping in mind the fact that you're going to stay with the body or, the, or with feelings or with mind states or with mental qualities as your primary frame of reference. That word primary is important because there's no way that you're going to be focused on the body without noticing feelings or noticing mind states or noticing mental qualities because they all come together right here. This is why the Buddha says that you can focus on any of the four and follow it all the way to awakening. But you choose one of them as being primary and then you relate the other three to that primary one. For instance, right now we're with the breath. When feelings come up, relate them to the breath. How does the breath affect the feelings? How do the feelings affect the way you breathe? For instance, if there's a pain in your body, do you tend to breathe in a way that walls off the pain so it doesn't spread? Because we do have a sense of the breath spreading, but we don't like the idea of the pain spreading. And so we tense up around it so that it doesn't spread with the breath. And if you find yourself doing that subconsciously, ask yourself, what if I consciously think of the breath going through the pain? Can I open up that part of the body? So in this way you keep the breath as primary, and then the pain becomes simply related to the breath. The same principle goes with mind states. Certain mind states are fostered by tense breathing, constricted breathing, and others, more skillful, are fostered by a sense of breath that flows thoroughly throughout the body, refreshing the body. You want to notice that and then take advantage of it. It's not that these tools we develop while we're meditating are used only while we're sitting here with our eyes closed. They're meant to be used throughout the day. You know, if somebody says something and you have a catch in the breath, you can take that as a warning. Okay? Something's going on in the mind as well. You've reacted to what that person has said. And if you have the time, you want to look into it. If you don't have time, just make a mental note and then try to breathe through whatever tension has developed in the breath so you're not carrying that little bit of tension around with you for the rest of the day, because then it acts like a magnet. It attracts other little bits and pieces of tension until you've got this huge armor with this huge cluster of tension that's invaded the body. And then there's the problem, how do you get it out? Whereas it's a lot easier if you begin to notice the little pieces as they come and you can breathe right through them. That puts you in a better position to look at the mind. Again, your basic foundation is the breath, but then you look at the mind from the position of a very comfortable, very refreshing, very fulfilling way of breathing. And you see the mind in a very different light than if you're looking at it from feeling all tensed and tight and wound up. So that's mindfulness. And it's on this mindfulness that you develop analysis of qualities, seeing which mind states or which breath states or breath patterns are skillful and which ones are not. And you learn how to foster the skillful ones. This is another area where conviction comes in, as the Buddha says. If it weren't possible to develop skillful qualities and to abandon unskillful ones, you wouldn't teach it. And if it weren't the fact that you would benefit from skillful, developing skillful ones and abandoning unskillful ones, he wouldn't teach that either. You have to have conviction that he knows what he's talking about. It 
But this factor of analysis of qualities is very much a path factor. It's what enables you to see what needs to be done. And it's based on that, then you have the factor of persistence, which is essentially right effort. And to encourage right effort, it's good to develop heedfulness, realizing that you really do need to develop skillful qualities. You can't wait until tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. You need to do this now, because you could die at any moment. Not just physical death. Your goodness could die at any moment. Something could come up. Either thought about something that someone has done, or an actual event right here, right now, that could catch you off guard. And you could do or say things that are really harmful. That can happen at any time. So you have to be careful. You have to be heedful. And it's when you're heedful like this. It's when the other factors, the factors that talk about how mindfulness and discernment lead to concentration. And you've got the rapture that comes as the mind gets more and more full, as your sense of the breath energy gets more and more full, as you're not wounding it with unskillful thoughts and unskillful attitudes. From that there's serenity. From serenity there's concentration. When the mind is concentrated, it can look at things with a more solid sense of equanimity. As the Buddha said, there's the equanimity that comes from diversity, i.e. you simply make up your mind that whatever comes up in terms of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations or ideas, you're just going to try to stay non-reactive. That kind of equanimity can be maintained as long as you maintain your mindfulness and maintain your will to be non-reactive. A lot stronger, though, is the equanimity, as the Buddha says, based on unity, unification, i.e. when the mind really settles down and is one. That sense of serenity, well-being, and fullness. You feel less touched by events outside, because you've got something much better to feed on. You're not going out nibbling off other people's words. or devouring sensual pleasures, because you've got something much better right here. It's not simply a matter of willing yourself not to react. You don't feel any need to react. But we're not practicing these things just to arrive at equanimity. Again, that's another problem with seeing that. Awakening factors as a map of the enlightened mind, because people think, well, all you have to do is arrive at equanimity, and there you are, nirvana. But that's not the case. It's part of the path. You gain equanimity toward all the things that are not important in life, and keep analyzing that issue of what's skillful and unskillful in the mind. Because what the Buddha is doing is putting you in a position where your happiness depends more and more and more on one thing, the good qualities of the mind, the mind as it's trained. Because you use this sense of well-being to pry away your attachments. Because as you can see, when you do this sort of action or this sort of verbal action, you get these results. When you foster this quality of mind, you get these results. And when you foster that quality of mind, you get other kinds of results. And you get more and more sensitive to where there's stress. Again, you have to look at the particulars. This is why analysis of qualities is the central factor here. You're looking at events. The word dhamma, or qualities, can also mean actions. And here we're particularly looking at mental actions. Look at your actions and see what you're doing, where there's stress, what you did to aggravate that stress, what you could do to get rid of it, to undercut it, 
i.e., how you abandon the, the cause. When you follow these questions all the way to those questions about wherever there's anything that's inconstant, it's stressful, wherever everything that's stressful, something to be regarded as not self, something to let go, let go, let go. But it's all of these qualities working together that can take you to awakening. If you try to do the letting go without having the concentration developed, it gets very dry and very alienating. I've heard cases of people letting go of their sense of self prematurely, and they get very disoriented. They think, well, I've let go of my sense of self, and it must be awakening, but it's destabilizing. They've cut away all the tools they need in order to stay on the path, because you do need a sense of self to function on the path, a wise sense of self, a skillful sense of self, which you've been developing as part of the path. You let it go only when you don't need it anymore. And part of that sense of self is the state of well-being that comes when you get the mind in a good, strong concentration. So all these factors are needed. But it's important to remember that, one, they are the path. We're not trying to clone awakening. So you're not trying to will the mind into some expansive, wonderful state. The path to waking is followed in little tiny incremental steps, i.e. looking at each of your actions and every instance of stress as it comes up. The more precisely you can see these things, the more minutely you can focus to stay away from the abstractions, stay away from these wonderful concepts. And just look at what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. Seek the counsel of the wise when you need it, but otherwise stay focused right here on the particulars, and it's through the particulars that you break through. To a state that's not defined in any way at all. It's called freedom because in reaching that state we're freed from our defilements. I.e., it's called freedom in, as a comparison, but in and of itself it's not defined.